Amen. So keep your place in Leviticus chapter 1. That's where we're going to be for the entire sermon. We're going to be referencing back and forth. So when you leave Leviticus chapter 1, just keep a bookmark there. We're going to come back and forth to um, the book of Leviticus. So we're starting a new sermon series tonight. The sermon series is on the offering. So in the first um, seven chapters of Leviticus, we see five main offerings that are detailed out for the children of Israel to be doing. Um, in the book of Leviticus in these first few chapters. We're going to look at these um, sacrifices and see how they, what do they picture, how do they, um, how do they apply to us in our lives um, today. Because remember, all of these sacrifices, everything that they did in the Old Testament, were just pictures or foreshadowings of things that are to come. All right, so tonight in Leviticus chapter 1, we're going to be looking at this burnt offering. The burnt offering is the first offering that we'll look at um, in our sermon series. And if you're there in Leviticus chapter 1, we'll, you'll notice as we just read uh, the chapter that I'm going to give you four points tonight that um, describe the burnt offering as, and it's, look, it's unique. Each of these offerings, some of them have things that are similar, but all of these offerings have things that are unique. So tonight I'm going to give you four points on the burnt offering that is um, unique to the burnt offering, and hopefully I can explain to you um, why the burnt offering is there. So keep in mind that this is offerings that the children of Israel are doing when they have the tabernacle. You know, there is no, um, they're, they're doing this in front of the tent. You know, this is um, the, the beginning of these, um, the Levitical law. There was not, you know, they were not um, in Solomon's temple at this point. You know, we're hundreds of years um, from that point in history. They're doing these things um, in front of the tabernacle, and this is the Levitical priesthood. You know, Moses' um, brother Aaron was the, the first high priest there, and he was doing, he was c commanded to be doing these ritual sacrifices in front of the tabernacle, or in the tabernacle. Look at um, Ephesians chapter 5, if you would. Ephesians chapter 5, and you're going to keep your place in Leviticus chapter 1. So the first unique thing about the burnt sacrifice that we need to see tonight is that it's a complete sacrifice. All right, Not every one of the sacrifices that we're going to talk about is a complete sacrifice sacrifice. And I'll explain that in a little bit more detail when we look at, you know, next week, we look at the next offering and how it's not a complete sacrifice, that certain things, uh, you know, of the sacrifice go here and other things of the sacrifice go here. But the burnt offering is a complete sacrifice. And this part of the offering shows the foreshadowing of Christ's sacrifice himself on how Christ's sacrifice was a complete sacrifice sacrifice. We should all be very happy that Christ's sacrifice was a complete sacrifice. Look at Ephesians chapter 5 and verse number 2. I'm glad, I'm thankful that Christ gave all, that he didn't hold anything back, that he sacrificed everything. Look at Ephesians chapter 5 and verse number 2 and notice the, the, the wording here and how this matches perfectly with what we just read in Leviticus chapter 1. It says, and walk in love as Christ also hath loved us. Why, how did Christ love us? Did, by saying, oh, I love you and all lovey-dovey feelings towards you? No. He had given himself for us an offering and sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. That exact same wording that we see in Leviticus chapter 1 talking about the burnt offering, all right? And I'm going to get into that sweet-smelling savor um, in a couple points down the road. But many of the offerings that we're going to look at in this sermon series, you will see that things are held back for certain reasons, and we'll look at that. But the burnt offering is a complete offering. The entire animal was, yes, it was divided up in a certain way, but everything was burned on the altar. It was complete. All right. And by the way, you know, the burnt, the fire part of it definitely is, is part of that complete sacrifice picture of Christ as well as Christ in Acts chapter 2 and verse 31, you know, he spent, his soul literally went to hell. You know, his soul was not left in hell, the Bible clearly says. It shows the completeness of Christ's Sacrifice, and it shows. I mean, you know that. I mean, hell is is defined by fire in, in the Bible. You know, not only is the lake of fire the final destination of hell, 
But in uh, Matthew chapter 5, we see the, the words hellfire used. Other places in the Bible talks about the torments of hell and the torments of just eternal destruction, smoke of their torment. You know, I mean, all of this pictures, this burnt sacrifice pictures the completeness of Christ's sacrifice. And I mean, people that for some reason preach against like Christ going to hell, you know, they say all kinds of silly things like, oh, you're saying that the death on the cross wasn't enough or I don't even know what that means because, you know, they say, oh, when he, Jesus was on the cross, he said it was it is finished. That means that, well, obviously Jesus did not mean the entire gospel was finished on the cross because he still hadn't risen from the dead. I mean, what in the world are you talking about? So, I mean, Jesus' sacrifice was everything. It was everything. It was the death on the cross. It was the blood. It was all of these things. It was his soul going to hell. And, of course, it was the resurrection. You know, you cannot be saved if you don't believe Jesus rose from the dead. I mean, that's Matthew or, or Romans 10, 9 right there. So, I mean, look, Jesus Christ's sacrifice was complete. Now, look, I'm glad it was complete. Look at Leviticus chapter 1. Go back to Leviticus chapter 1. Look at verse number 8. Let's look at this. The Bible says in Leviticus chapter 1, in verse number 8, it says, And the priests, Aaron's sons, shall lay the parts, the head and the fat, in order upon the wood that is on the fire which is upon the altar. Okay, so there we see some parts. But then look at verse number 9. But his inwards, these are like the innards, all right? The, the, you know, the in, inwards parts of the animal. His lay and his leg shall he wash in water, and the priest shall burn all on the offer. So yeah, they have to wash certain parts of it, but everything is burnt. To be a burnt sacrifice, an offering made by fire of a sweet savor unto the Lord. So it just pictures the completeness of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And look, I mean, I'm glad that the sacrifice was complete. And it also pictures, by the way, the completeness of your salvation through that complete sacrifice. I mean, the idea that you could lose your salvation doesn't make sense on so many, le on any level, actually. I mean, even just using the words, even just using how people can be out there, how the Pentecostal today can believe that you can be saved and then lose your salvation. Like, d just stop using the word saved. Just stop using that terminology because it doesn't make any sense. I mean, how are you saved if you, if you die? How are you saved if you end up in hell? It's like, you know, you know, going out and saving somebody from drowning, right? You go out and you save somebody from drowning. You do this heroic act. You're like, I just saved you. And then you take them out and you drown them. Did you really save them? I mean, it just, it doesn't even make any sense that the Bible would even use the terminology for by grace are ye saved. Thou shalt be saved. It wouldn't make any sense to even use the word. Because if somebody gets saved and then they go to hell, like what in the world? They weren't even saved. I mean, how could you call that saved? I mean, this is just kind of a rabbit trail. But I mean, losing your salvation doesn't make any sense. Okay? And it flies in the face against the completeness of Jesus' sacrifice. And it flies in the face against the completeness of your personal salvation. All right, so this is the first point of the burnt offering. Don't miss the fact that it is a complete offering. Everything is offered. And if Jesus held anything back, he would not have been able to save us. So the completeness was necessary for what Jesus did. Go back to Leviticus chapter 1 and look at verse number 2. Let's look at verse number 2 and verse number 3. The second point I want to make about this burnt offering is that it was voluntary. It was voluntary. Look at verse number 2, where the Bible says, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, If any man of you bring an offering unto the Lord, ye shall bring an offering of your cattle, even of the herd, and of the flock. We're going to talk about those three categories in a couple minutes too. But look at verse number 3. If his offering be a burnt sacrifice of the herd, let him offer a male without blemish, he shall offer it of his own voluntary will at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation before the Lord. Of course, it's a male without blemish. Why? Because it's picturing 
the sinless Jesus Christ, the sinless Messiah. It is a picture of what is to come. But the second point I want to make is that this offering, this burnt offering, this is not something that every man had to do, you know, uh, every month or whatever. This was a voluntary offering that somebody would bring of the herd, of the flock, and of the, uh, what do they call it, of the, um, of the flock, of the herd, and of the cattle. So it's either going to be uh, a, a cow, a sheep, or a bird of some kind. All right, and it's, it was a free choice, but it had to be voluntary. God wanted, to, you know, the, the people, the children of Israel, he wanted them to do this of their own free will. I mean, it's, a really, a, it's really a case, it's really a great case in the Bible to show us that God wants us to have free will. That God gave us free will. I mean, look, there's points all over the Bible. Actually, turn to Genesis chapter 2. God has always wanted man to have free will. God never created man to have a bunch of, you know, just to be a bunch of robots that just follow him and, you know, they are just predestined to just, you know, get saved and be great Christians. That's a bunch of garbage. It's found nowhere in the Bible. God has always created man to have free will. And that's why God is labeling this burnt sacrifice. He's like, you know what? I want you to do this of your own free will. I want you to do this. If you do this of your voluntary self, you come here and give this to me, here's how you do it. But it had to be voluntary. So it would have been wrong for somebody to just drag some goat or sheep or whatever, a male, you know, ram and without blemish and be like, I can't believe this or kick the thing and, you know, be like, I, I guess I got to give this because, you know, my uncle says I should or whatever. I mean, you know, that would have been wrong from the, from the beginning. God wanted it to be of free will. God wants us to have free will. God created man to have free will. From the very beginning, look at Genesis chapter 2, verse number 16. Look at what the Bible says. From the beginning, God created man to have free will. And the Lord commanded the man, saying, of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. So this is super important right here just to prove free will and how God created man, how man literally just has free will. God gave them one rule at the beginning. He said you can eat anything you want in the garden. And look, there was no poison mushrooms in, in the garden. There was no poison oak. There was no, you know, weed or whatever, you know, people are like wanting to eat today to, you know, get all messed up in their head and, and turn themselves into fools. But he said, don't eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. He didn't put a force field around it. You know, he didn't make this magical like thing that you can't approach or you get shocked or something. He just said, don't do it. Don't touch it. Or what? What does the Bible teach? The Bible teaches free will or consequences. That's what the Bible teaches. And like what we're missing today, you say, how is our society such a mess today? Because we're not teaching the consequences anymore. You know, man still has free will, but we're not teaching the consequences, which by the way, are there whether people like it or not. He says, don't touch it or else consequences. See, there's sin all around us. It's the same thing today. There's sin all around us as saved Christians today. There's sin all around us, and there's consequences all around us. And the sin, it's there for the taking. It's there for the taking. And the consequences are always there. We always must choose the right way. It's the same thing, because we have free will. I mean, for, for a lot of people, free will is not a good thing for them. But it's there. And the consequences are always there. I mean, turn to Hosea chapter 1. We talked about this last, I mean, we were chatting about this last Sunday night or something. I can't remember. But think of a husband and wife analogy. Think of a husband and wife analogy. You say, why did God give man free will? It's really easy to understand. You go find a guy that's married or not married. I don't care who it is. Or even a gal and ask her the same question. You ask her, hey, would you like to have someone be your husband who is forced to love you? Would you like someone to be married to you? Would you like to meet a young lady? Young men, would you like to meet a young lady 
who somebody puts a gun to her, her head and says, you must marry brother so-and-so. No, no man would want that. No, no person would want someone to be forced to love them. To, oh, you know, they'll, they'll take this pill once a day and then they'll love you or whatever. I mean, it's just like nobody would want that. Everybody wants their spouse to just freely love them. This is a problem with, with a lot of marriages, by the way. This is a lot, problem with a lot of marriages. Like, you know, inevitably a husband treats a wife like garbage for 10, 15, 20 years, and pretty soon, you know, it works the same way too, by the way. Pretty soon, you know, you know that, that love fades. You know, that, that it just fades. You're just like, what happened? You know, it didn't happen overnight. Pretty soon, you know, you have some, some wife who's just terrible to her husband for years and years and years, and pretty soon he's off in the wilderness somewhere. Pretty soon, he's up in the corner of a house somewhere. He wants nothing to do with his wife. You're like, why? I want him to love me. I want her to love me. All this. But look, you can drive people away. You can drive people away by how you treat them. But back to the point. God uses this husband and wife analogy all the time in the Bible, especially relating to the children of Israel. And in Hosea chapter 1, Hosea, Hosea was a... Uh, prophet, um, he's one of the minor prophets, right after the book of Daniel, we find the book of Hosea, but he's one of the minor prophets, his contemporaries were Jonah, Amos, there's one more somewhere, um, I think Micah was also one of his contemporaries, but basically he was at, he was mainly a, a prophet to the northern kingdom of Israel at the end of their reign, and actually he was a prophet during a couple of Jehu's sons who we learned about this morning. So Jehu was promised by God because he did such a great job. God told him, you're going to have four generations of sons. So if you ever look at the, the genealogy of the kings of the children of, of the northern kingdom of Israel, the longest reigning family is Jehu's family because he had son after son after son after son, and two of those sons were underneath the, um, the, 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 the prophecy of Hosea. All right. So Hosea is kind of ripping face against the northern kingdom of Israel. They're about to be taken over. It, I mean, we're within just a couple of decades at Hosea's time of, you know, the Assyrian Empire coming in and wiping out the northern kingdom of Israel. But look at Hosea, um, chapter number one, and look at the analogy that God uses. I mean, God gets pretty extreme with this analogy with Hosea, all right? Look what he says. He says, the beginning of the word of the Lord by Hosea. And the Lord said to Hosea, Go, take unto thee a wife of whoredoms, and the children of whoredoms, for the land hath committed great whoredom, departing from the Lord. He tells this prophet, Go marry a prostitute. He says, Go marry a harlot. And, and you know, Hosea's like, Oh, man, could we use some other, you know, you would think, he'd be like, I wish I would have gotten, like, the dung analogy. That would have been better. But he's literally told by God to go marry a, a, a prostitute. You say, why? So he went and he took Gomer, the daughter of Diblium, which conceived and bare him a son. So he goes and he marries. So, I mean, first of all, guys, like, what was your name? Gomer? Just run, right? <laughs> like, I don't know. Like, so you're not probably going to see a lot of ladies or a lot of kids or young ladies named Gomer. You know what I mean? For many different reasons, especially if they know the Bible. But I mean, I mean, he's like, oh, she's a she's a harlot. What's your name? Gomer. Oh man, that double whammy. <laughs> I mean, it's a terrible name. As a matter of fact, it was funny because I was on a plane a few months ago, and I was sitting on this plane, and there was this this plane head. Speaking of, of terrible names, I mean, this is not a a crazy preacher story. This actually happened to me, okay? And there was pre-ordered meals before we got on the plane. So the stewardess was asking everyone what their names were in the seats. So she knew <coughs> who, who had what meal. And she goes up to the lady. There was an older lady sitting next to me to my right. And she goes up to the lady and she says, am I pronouncing your, your name right? And the lady goes, Nightmare. Yes, Nightmare. That's my name. And I'm just like, what in the world? Her first name was Nightmare. <laughs> Like, talk about, talk about a name that you probably should have just changed, right? I mean, parents have issues with, with, with this at this time. But anyway, and then she says, and then she says, but people just call me Alabama. 
And then for the rest of the flight, it was just like Miss Alabama, Miss Alabama, nightmare was never used. But anyway, that's up there with Gomer, okay? Anyway, so God, God uses this analogy of a marriage to describe the relationship that he has with his people, okay? And his people were committing whoredoms against him. God was using the children of Israel to, and he was comparing, he used this extreme example with his prophet to show that the children of Israel, they're committing adultery against me. They're going, you know, committing whoredom after other gods. They are, they're going off and they're breaking their covenant with me, is what God was saying. And he uses this extreme example. But back to the point. God does not want some, you know, wife. So he doesn't want us to be forced to, be, to love him. He doesn't want that. But there's going to be consequences. And that's what, you know, follows in the book of Hosea. And yet, there definitely was consequences for the northern kingdom of Israel. And those consequences were coming soon. At least he sent the prophets to warn them. You know, at least he sent the prophets. But the point is, this was to be a free will offering, and that's what God wants from us. He wants free will offerings from us. He wants us to voluntarily love the Lord. I mean, it's not a hard concept. That's what God wants. So if you ever feel like, like, man, I just feel like I'm being forced to do this and forced to read the Bible and forced, look, that is, it's, something is wrong with your heart at that point. Something is, there is a major issue there because God you should voluntarily want to offer to the Lord. You should voluntarily want to give to the Lord. That's what God did for you, by the way. He voluntarily gave you without holding anything back through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. So, I mean, the argument against free will, like with the Calvinists and all that, is it's, it's insanity. It's, it's nowhere in the Bible. I mean, free will is everywhere in the Bible, even in this sacrifice in Leviticus chapter 1. Go back to Leviticus chapter 1. Go back to Leviticus chapter 1. So the first two things that we see are is that it was a complete offering, picturing the complete sacrifice, the complete salvation that Christ's complete sacrifice provides for us. I'm completely saved. You don't have to say completely saved. You can just say, I'm saved, if you're saved. If you trusted on Jesus, you are saved, which means you are completely saved. Otherwise, the word saved doesn't even make sense. So, it was complete. The second point is it was voluntary. Christ wants a voluntary service from us to him. It's a reasonable service, folks. Look at verse number, verse number 9 of Leviticus chapter 1. The third point I want to make is that this sacrifice, being complete and being voluntary was pleasing to the Lord. Look at verse number 9. And I want to point out that any of these sacrifices was pleasing to the Lord. Remember, you could have offered a cow. You could have offered a sheep. You could have offered a bird, a, tur a, a turtle dove. I mean, you could, I mean, which of those is more expensive? There's clearly, you know, a higher value on cattle than there is on sheep. You know, the Bible even, you know, Counts that like six to one or something. I forget. I think it's six to one. But the Bible actually acknowledges that there's a highly worldly, higher worldly value on the top of this list. But notice something here. Any of these sacrifices is pleasing to the Lord. Look at verse number nine. It says, but his inwards and his legs shall be washed in water. This is the, the, the cattle. And the priest shall burn all on the altar to be a burnt sacrifice, an offering made by fire, of a sweet savor unto the Lord. Meaning it is a pleasing smell. It is a pleasing sight. It is a pleasing thing to the Lord. Look at verse number 13. Talking about the flock. Again, he shall wash the inwards and legs with water. The priest shall bring it all and burn it on the altar. It is a burnt sacrifice. An offering made by fire of a sweet savor unto the Lord. It doesn't say like, oh, it wasn't as good as the first one. But... No, it's a sweet savor. The, the Lord is pleased with this. The Lord is just as pleased in verse number 13 as he was in verse number 9. Now look at the bird. You say, just a bird? Really? This guy gets away with just giving a bird. Look at verse number 17. And he shall cleave it with the wings thereof, but shall do not divide it asunder, and the priest shall burn it on the altar. Upon the wood that is upon the fire, it is a burnt sacrifice, an offering made by fire of what? 
of a sweet savor unto the Lord, but not as good as the sheep. No, it's just a sweet savor unto the Lord. Whatever was given in the burnt sacrifice in these three categories, whether it was a bird, a sheep, or the cattle, was pleasing to the Lord. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. So you say, why, why the different options? Why, why did God give the different options here? It was voluntary, it was free will, it was complete, and either one of these three options was complete, or was, was pleasing to the Lord. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Let me show you a concept in the Bible that Paul lays out for the church at Corinth here. Look at verse number 12 of, of 1 Corinthians chapter number 12. Now, why different options? The answer is because people have different situations. People have different situations. People have different means. Maybe somebody raised birds. Maybe somebody raised cattle. Maybe somebody didn't have sheep. Maybe some people had more resources than other people had resources. And guess what? A church is going to be filled with people of all different means, all different resources, all different talents, actually. Look at verse number 12. The Bible says this. It says, as the body is one, talking about the body of Christ that is this church, and hath many members. Now, it's, he's using an analogy of, like, a, a body. He's using an analogy of, like, a person's body and a church. And all the members of that one body being many are one body, so also is Christ. For by one spirit we are all baptized into one body. That's the body of Christ. Whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, whether we be all made to drink into one spirit. For the body is not one member, but many. The, the body is not just a finger. The body is not just a hand. The body is made up of many members. If the foot, now he goes into more, more detail in this analogy, he says, if the foot shall say, because I am not the hand, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? And if the ear shall say, because I am not the eye, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? Saying, well, what if, you know, the eye, you know, the eye is more important, thinks the ear. That's what this is going at. Or the foot is more important, thinks the hand, or whatever. He's talking about, you know, you can't have one member of a body saying, oh, because I'm not the most important part, I'm not part of the body. This is what Paul is getting at. Because if the whole body were an eye, where would be the hearing? You ever playing those games? I mean, do you ever play these games with your friends when you were a kid? Would you rather be blind or deaf? You know, all these kinds of games that you guys play? Am I the only one that played those with my friends? The answer is neither. Because if you were all eyes, you couldn't hear anything. If you were all ears, you couldn't see anything. If the whole were hearing, where were the smelling? What if you didn't have a nose? But now that God set the members, every one of them, in the body, as it hath pleased him. And if they were all one member, where is the body? If everybody's a hand, there is no body. See what he's getting at here? This is a pretty brilliant little um, kind of diatribe that he's going off on here. He's like, he's saying if they're all hands, if they're all fingers, you know, it, it just, all the members is what makes up the actual body, folks. But you're, there are many members, yet but one body. The eye cannot say unto the hand, I have no need of thee, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. Nay, much more, those members of the body which seem to be more feeble are necessary. He's saying, even when people look and they say, oh, the cow is better, clearly a cow is better than a, a dove. What Paul here is saying is that even the most feeble members of a body, which seem, when he says feeble, he's saying feeble to our eyes, to our view. He's saying those members are all Necessary. Even the seemingly small things is what he's talking about here. And those members of the body which we think to be less honorable, I mean, isn't that true? Isn't that true that there are positions that you think are more honorable and less honorable? I mean, obviously, if, if you're out in the world and somebody's, a, uh, you know, some big shot 
you know, manager or director at some company or something, isn't that considered to be a more honorable thing than somebody who's just the guy that, you know, cleans the floors or, or whatever? or you know is the is the you know orders the materials or something like that i mean these this is man's problem though is what paul is explaining and those members of the body which we think to be less honorable upon these we bestow more abundant honor this is the problem paul is saying and on our uncomely parts have more abundant abundant comeliness look he's saying that it shouldn't be this way in the church He's saying that, oh, you know, you got some guy, he seems very honorable. You know, you got some guy, he, where he's an usher at the church. That seems to be very honorable. And look, it is honorable, and not everybody can be an usher. That's true. But guess what? There also needs to be people that do all the other things, that doesn't get, you know, the visibility. I, I, made, this com I made this comment several times in the satellite ministry, but there is no magic button here. When we leave here on Sunday night, one of the most you know, seemingly feeble and silent ministries in a church like this is when we leave Sunday night and this place is wrecked, especially when we, when we eat or have some kind of food or whatever. This place looks like a bomb went off. Look, it's good. I'm happy about it. But there's no magic button that you go push on the back wall saying, reset church. There's people, and in our case, there's ladies that come in every two days and reset the church. And, you know, there's no usher tag for them. There's no, you know, that would be one of those less honorable. But look, it's not a less honorable position. That's what Paul is saying. It's necessary. Look, we couldn't have church Wednesday night. It would be a disaster. Can you imagine if a visitor walked in here and we just never cleaned the church? If, if, if my wife and the ladies that help out were just like, you know what, it's too much. It's too much. I'm not getting the honor that I deserve around here. And I was just like, whatever. Let's just roll with it. Just whatever, bro. Let's just, let's just be you and us and, and whatever we feel like. And the chairs were just a disaster. There we got, you know, I mean, everyone's, they're sleep, you know, people are just laying in bean bags. And I mean, there's pizza all over the floor. There's rotting food everywhere. And a visitor comes in. Look, we would have no visitors. Look, it, the, everything has to be decent and in order. These are honorable positions. This is what Paul is saying. It's like, this is what men do, this is what men do though. Men look at things like, oh, that's honorable, and ah, I don't want to do that. But it's all necessary. Every part of it is necessary. Look at verse 25. It says that there should be no schism in the body, that the members should have the same care for one another. So... The, the people that are in honorable positions should have the same care as people that are in the less honorable positions, the people that run the AV and the people that do the bulletins, the people that do all the maps and the people that make you know, all the different invites and all the different things and order things for the church. Look, those things, every single person, every single member needs to be appreciated because without it, none of, there would be no body. Everyone can't be a hand. Look, it's much more than just the pastor. You know, if we just had, like, everybody was a pastor, like, it would be a disaster in many different ways. But, I mean, it would just be a disaster because we need all the members. We need all the, the fingers and the ears and the eyes and the hands and the feet. And, and, and you know, the nose, right? So we can tell if things aren't clean. <laughs> but this is what Paul is saying, and this is why there's three different sacrifices. Because people have different means. People have different resources. He said, but now you're all... You're, you're the body of Christ and members in particular. Look, look at verse 26. I skipped it. He says, whether one member suffer, all the members suffer with it. Or if one member be honored, all the members rejoice with it. I mean, that, look, we win. I mean, that's such a beautiful verse. He's saying we win and we lose together in the church is what he is saying. So not every person needs to be a pastor. Not every single person, you know, needs to even go into the ministry. Pastor Jimenez has said this many times, and it's such a great blanket statement. I mean, if there's good blanket statements, this is a good one. He says, every single person, every single saved Christian should either be a pastor, should either go into the ministry, you're like, oh, I don't know, or they should be supporting a ministry. That is such a great statement right there. Every single person should be either go into the ministry, which, look, very few people are going to go into the ministry. As far as the percentage of saved Christian men out there, very few of those are going to go into the ministry. And, but 
then you should be supporting a ministry if you're not going to go into the ministry. You should be one of these members that he's talking about. Even if you're like, oh, well, all I have is this dove to give. All I have is something from the flocks. Hey, give it voluntarily, give it completely, and it's necessary, and it's just as pleasing to the Lord. That's what you have to understand. It's just as pleasing to the Lord to give the bird as it is to give the, the cattle. So look, even like all the smaller ministries should never be diminished in, in a church from the, the cleaning, I mean, I mean the cleaning ministry. I mean the cleaning ministry is one of the most difficult ministries at this church. It requires the most labor, you know, the most physical labor um, at the church for sure. You know, all the different things I was thinking about today, I was thinking about as far as different members of the church, a Spanish speaker in this church, a Spanish speaker in this church is a powerful member of this church, is a great member of this church. Look, all the members are great, but that's just another member of the church. If you can, you can speak Spanish in Fresno and give the gospel in Spanish, that's a member that's needed. That's like an ear. You know, that's like a, that's like a, a powerful member of a ministry. But, I mean, there's everything. Become a member is what, you know, even if all you have is a bird. That's the, that's the key to why there are three sacrifices for the burnt offering. Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 9. 2 King Corinthians chapter 9, and look at verse number 7. But the trick is this. The trick is this. If you say, I'm going to be a member, I'm going to, you know, give a bird, I'm going to get involved somehow and be a member of this body, 2 Corinthians chapter 9 is a good key verse for you. It says, every man according as he purposes in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. That's exactly what we see with the burnt offering, is that God is very happy with this voluntary, complete offering. So if you just say to yourself, and now, now, now apply the, now let's get, you know, 400 level class with this. You're like, well, I, I don't want to give. I don't want to be part of, you know, the ministry. I don't want to, you know, voluntarily sacrifice anything in my life. Well, from the morning sermon, just serve first and the heart will follow. You know, start serving first and see what happens. You know, see what happens. The thoughts and, and the heart will follow, as Proverbs 16.3 says. Turn to Numbers chapter 23. There's one last point about the burnt offering that I want to show you this evening. Turn to Numbers chapter 23. So what do we see so far? It's a complete offering. It's a voluntary offering showing that God has given us free will. He wants us to voluntarily serve him, voluntarily love him, voluntarily, you know, give to him and support. Oh, that's the same thing here. I don't want anyone that feels like they're forced um, to be here. I want people to voluntarily want to serve the Lord in this church. I mean, that's, you know, my goal for this ministry. Look at Numbers chapter 23. Numbers chapter 23. And it, the third point was that God is pleased with it. If those two things match, God is pleased with it no matter what it is, whether it's a bird, a sheep, or a cow. Look at verse, uh, I think I said... Numbers chapter 23, I meant Numbers chapter 28. Look at verse uh, number, let me go there myself to make sure I don't have a mistake here. Go to Numbers chapter 28. Here's the last point about the burnt offering. Okay, yeah, verse number one of Numbers chapter 28. The burnt offering was continual. The burnt offering never stopped. That's the, th the next thing, the last thing I want you to see about the burnt offering. Look at verse number one of Numbers chapter 28. The burnt offering, so you say, what do, what do you mean? People, weren't people voluntarily bringing burnt offerings? Yes, people were voluntarily bringing burnt offerings, but there was a continual burnt offering that was always going on. Look at verse number one. It says, and the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Command the children of Israel and say unto them, My offering and my bread for my sacrifices made by fire for a sweet savor unto me shall ye observe to offer me in their due season. And thou shalt say unto them, This is the offering made by fire which ye shall offer unto the Lord two lambs of the first year without spot 
day by day for a continual burnt offering. So these voluntarily burnt offer, voluntary burnt offerings brought by the people were, they brought them, but there was an example set that there was a burnt offering to be made every single day. This is what Aaron, or, or, or the Lord, commanded Moses to do. Now shalt say unto them, the offering is it, a continual burnt offering. One lamb shall thou offer in the morning, and the other lamb shall thou offer at even. So there was a lamb in the morning that was offered, and a lamb in the evening that was offered, and then all the voluntary burnt offerings were just coming in there. But there was always a continual offering going on, a continual burnt offering that was going on at the tabernacle daily. And look, that doesn't change for us. That doesn't change for us. I am, I mean, think of this for a minute. Think of this for a minute. I am amazed in 2023 America. In 2023 America, what are we doing here? I am constantly reading um, the, the, I'm reading the, the tea leaves, the culture of the day that we are in. We're not, look, we're not in post-Christian America. That's not what people are saying anymore. People are saying we are in post-religious America. People are saying, like, the, the numbers of people that just believe nothing, they're just rejecting. Look, they're not going, you know, into Islam or whatever. There's just the numbers of people that are just rejecting all religion, all ideas of even any kind of God are through the roof in America today. I mean, and what do we see? No one goes to church anymore. Those numbers have never been higher. It's because, look, you had a bunch of people as we went into COVID that didn't really like going to church anyway. And then they got to stay home and they just never went back. So you got this America today where there's never been a time where a few, a, the, the smallest percentage of people go to church. I mean, the smallest percentage of people know the Bible? We, we saw a sign at, uh, at Bravo Farms, you know, one of these uh, uh, signs with a Bible verse on it, and it said, and like, we're the only ones that caught it, and we were just like, what in the world? It was like, I am the way, the truth, and the life, because they never put the whole verse. But it said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. They put half of John 14, 6, but then it said, uh, I am the way, the truth, and the life, John 14, 16. <laughs> They're like selling the sign. Yeah, nobody will catch that. It'll be fine. They'll sell, they'll sell a million of them. But the point is, there's never been a time in our, the history of our country where less people know the Bible, care about the Bible, believe the Bible's true, go to church, any of that. It's, it's at an all-time low in the history of our country, and yet here we are growing a church. That is a miracle. Because the way of the Lord is to have a continual burnt offering. Christianity, the gospel, the truth, will never die. As a matter of fact, it's designed to where the harder people press on it, the more it grows. That's why it's here today, is because people successfully, as we talked about last week, passed it on to the next generation, what we're trying to do. But just think about this today. Think of the miracle of the fact that when all the fires are going out, here we are still having a continual burnt offering. Still having this, this and look, it's not, it's not us. It's us being obedient and God granting the miracle. That's what's happening. We are just simply doing what the Bible tells us to do, standing out in the sun and going out and preaching the gospel, no matter how we feel or how much water we brought with us or whatever it is. We just continually go out and God just gives the increase. God keeps blessing. In 2023 America, it, I mean, you couldn't even say it would be possible to grow a church if it wasn't a miracle. But here we are growing a biblical church, sorry. Growing a biblical church in post-religious America. Like, how is that possible? According to the pop culture, it's not. Look, it's still pretty, pretty easy to serve the Lord today, folks. I mean, you know, we still have, you know, we still have this remnant of the First Amendment that's still there. We can still use it. You know, let's keep, let's use it. Let's use this remnant of this good idea that we had put in place a few hundred years ago to keep this sweet smelling savor to the Lord going. And that's what we're doing here. 
You know, so the, the burnt offering at what? It's a complete offering, number one. It's a voluntary offering. This, is, this all applies to our Christian life. You know, we should be completely offering our lives to the Lord. We should be voluntarily offering our lives to the Lord. We, and it will be pleasing to the Lord when you do that. And then on top of that, it should be continual. You should not be this person that's this bottle rocket Christian that's just like, I'm going to really hit it hard for two years, and then I'm out. There's a lot of people like that. Well, they're, they're going to die, you know, when they're in their 90s or whatever, however old they are, and they're going to look back at those two years and be like, well, I really did it right then. But it's supposed to be continual. It's supposed to continue throughout your entire life. And look, it will be pleasing to the Lord if you do that. And that's why God will say, you know, well done, thou good and faithful servant, to, you know, probably a very few amount of people. But this is the burnt offering. This is what it pictures, and it applies. All of these things apply directly to us. And if you say, you know what, I'm not some great speaker, I'm not some great whatever, it, just give a dove then. Give a dove. And by the way, the, 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 great, the great people are never who God uses in the Bible. It's always the, it's always the fishermen. It's always the, the lowly guy. Why? God wants to take somebody who is of low estate in the world's eyes and use that person to do great things. Why? Because it shows the power of the Lord. It shows the power of God. For, for some great, you know, order and some great powerful person that's just, you know, he can speak well and he can do all these things. You know, for him to stand up and do something great, you know, everyone's like, well, yeah, but look at the guy. He's pretty great. Or look at that lady. You know, she's, she's good at everything she does. Or whatever. But no, God uses the low people. God uses the small members. God uses the people that only have a bird, only have a mite to do great things because it shows his glory. That's what God wants from us. And that's how the burnt offering applies to our lives. Let's bow our heads and have a word.